Buenos días. Hablo español muy poquito. So I will be speaking in English now. Um, I have to start by saying that my job title is actually Deputy CTO. Gil Tene is our real CTO. I'm kind of the understudy. Now, what I wanted to do with this presentation was to kind of have a little bit of a look back on where we were and how we got to where we are, and then have a think about what the future is. Because last year there were some big celebrations because Java turned 20 years old. And this year, it's 21 years old. So um, I was in Bulgaria a few weeks ago. Is uh, the guy from J Prime, was he, is he here? Where was he? No, I can't see. No, OK. Um, I was in Bulgaria, and they had a conference where they said Java's 21 years old. It's legally old enough to drink. So I thought, right, what can we talk about in terms of Java and its history and then where it's going? And the thing that really kind of interests me was how open source has impacted Java and how we've seen the OpenJDK project come about, because that's 10 years old as well. And so I started looking around, and I found this picture, which I think is quite nice, because it's one of these ones where you, you kind of look at it for a while, and you start seeing things in it, and then you try and pick out more and more things. And it's really a sort of collection of different logos, if you like, that have been used for open source projects. So you've got the most recognizable one there. There's Tux the Penguin. There's Duke. Um, there's the Mozilla dinosaur there. There's the GNU in the background. And for those of you, you might recognize there's the BSD uh, sort of devil in there. And there's, there's a few others in there, because there's like a fish tank at the back. I think that might be glassfish. I'm not quite sure about that one. And then there's a couple of other ones on the table. But it's, it's sort of interesting just to look at how many things you can recognize in there. But it sort of brings uh, an interesting point, which is there is a lot of open source software out there. We use it all the time in the kind of things that we do. And so I thought, let's have a little look at how open source started out. Because you know, it didn't just suddenly appear. There's a, the reason that open source started. And you can really go way, way back in terms of computing history, way back to 1983, in fact, to see the origins of open source. Now, just as a show of hands, who was born after 1983 here? A okay, few people, yeah, right, you see, this is, this is what I mean. It's going way, way back in terms of, of the history of computing. Um, I can actually remember this because I was actually at university at this time. Um, and so in 1983, there was Richard Stallman. And Richard Stallman was somebody who wanted access to software, and he wanted it to be free. And that was his, his passion. And he started out with this thing called the GNU Project and the Free Software Foundation. And the idea of this was to make a free version of Unix. Because back in the, the going even further back, before 1983, Unix was not, well, Unix was free, in fact, because it, it was part of AT&T Bell Labs. And it came out of a research project. There were various people like Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie who created this operating system. And because AT&T was a telephone company, they actually gave away Unix. But then, in 1983, there was a change in terms of the way that AT&T worked. There were some legal things that happened. And so they decided to start charging for Unix. And that upset Richard Stallman. So he said, right, I want to create a free version of Unix. And that's where the GNU Foundation and the GNU um, project came from. And GNU is a sort of recursive definition, which is GNU is not Unix. And that's, that's where it comes from. So he did a lot of work on this, and they created a lot of code, and they developed a lot of pieces of Unix. But realistically, what they, they tended to do was they tended to focus on the sort of higher level things. They created a lot of the commands that you use. They created a lot of the libraries, all of those sorts of pieces. What they didn't really focus on was the kernel. And so they had a, a kernel which was called the herd. And that sort of was based on the, the Mac microkernel, for those of you who are old enough to remember any of that. But it wasn't very successful, it wasn't really very stable, and, and wasn't sort of ideal for certainly commercial type of applications. So if we move forward in time a little bit, what we'll find is that there's another person who came along. And you might recognize the person on the right here. It's not actually Harry Potter, it's 
Linus Torvald. Linus Torvald decided that he wanted to create a free version of Unix. And really his motivation wasn't so much because he wanted to make it freely available and let people use it. It was more because he wanted to learn about how things like the 80386 assembler worked. And so he started this project and he didn't really think it was going to be hugely successful. It was just a sort of thing that he wanted to work on. And out of that came the Linux kernel, which we're obviously all familiar with. But it's actually a little bit unfair to say that Linux is just the work of Linus Torvald. Because really, Linux is a combination of two things. It is the kernel, which Linus was, was responsible for, but it's also much of the work that Richard Stallman started with the GNU project. So all of the libraries, all of the command line stuff, that comes from GNU. So we see the GNU compiler and so on. So th this really sort of started things, and, and we've seen that Linux has been incredibly successful in terms of delivering open source software, free software that you can use any way you like. Again, moving forward a little bit, there was a very interesting paper that was written called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Anybody read this? A few people. Okay, good. And this was written by Eric S. Raymond. And what he did here was to compare and contrast the way that software is developed. And he used the analogy of cathedrals and a bazaar. And he said that you can have one approach, which is where you have very centralized control. You have a group of architects, in the case of a cathedral, who need to decide how this thing is going to be built. So they create plans, they draw those plans, and then they hand them over to the builders. The builders are really just there to implement what the architects want to build. So they do all the actual labor, they put the bricks in place, they put the, the roof on and so on. And you can contrast that with the other approach, which is more like the bazaar, which is open source. Because the cathedral is much more commercial, the way that software has been developed prior to open source software. With open source software, it's more about lots and lots of people getting involved, but not so much central control. Now, clearly, you know, projects do need some sort of central control to avoid you know, all sorts of things being added. And I mean, if you tried and build a cathedral with just everybody adding things wherever they wanted to, it would be a complete nightmare. But the idea of the bazaar is that you could have lots and lots of people all adding things in the idea of a common good and building something that delivers on what people actually need. So it's an interesting approach in terms of software development. Now again, if we move forward a little bit in terms of time, 1998. Now, who remembers the Netscape browser? Ah, good, most people. Excellent. So the Netscape browser was very successful. Launched in, what was it, 1995. And this became the most successful web browser that there was. But in 1998, Netscape were having some real problems. And the issue that they had was that there was another company who developed an operating system. And they decided that because people needed a web browser, what they would do is they would ship a web browser with their operating system. And this gave Netscape a bit of a problem because trying to sell something to somebody when somebody else is giving it away for free is quite difficult. You need to really differentiate yourself. And web browsers were very hard to differentiate in terms of what was being delivered. So in 1998, Netscape took a very big decision. It was quite a, a significant decision, which is they said, right, we're actually going to take the source code for Netscape, something which is commercial, and we are going to make it available to anybody who wants it. This was really the start of the open source movement in the sense of calling it open source. Before Netscape released their source code, it wasn't actually referred to as open source. It was all about free software. And so, as we know, this became Mozilla. So we now have the, the dinosaur rather than the, the Netscape sort of wheel logo. So that was a very significant thing. They took their source code and they made it freely available. At the same time, or, or slightly after that, there was a sort of consortium that was formed, and this is the, the open source initiative. And this was it's kind of a little bit interesting in terms of what the open source initiative actually is. If you, if you look on their website, they say that they are very much dedicated to promoting open source, the use of open source, 
understanding the different licensing that you can use for open source and so on. And one of the big things that they say is they are the custodian of the definition of open source, which is a little bit strange, but there you go. So they, they are the custodian of the definition. So open source now is starting to become much more mainstream, the late 1990s. And that really led to this, Apache. So I'm sure everybody here has heard of Apache. Apache was the idea of a software foundation. It was the idea that people could get together and create projects and make them open source and allow people to use them. Now, interestingly, anybody know why Apache is called Apache? Right, well, I'm not gonna get you to shout it out. But the reason is because it's Apache web server. The web server, that was, which was the main project that Apache started, they constantly had to keep adding patches to it. So they, they called it Apache web server, and that obviously led to, oh, well, let's just call it Apache, as in the, the Indians. Now, if you look at Apache, you'll find today that there are lots of projects, lots of very high-profile high projects that are hosted by Apache. So you've got the obvious ones like there's Ant for, uh, you know, if you're sort of doing building. There's things like Gradle. There's Maven, again, for doing building integration, things like that. There's Cassandra. There's Felix. There's Spark. Hadoop. All of those things are hosted on Apache. So there's a lot of different projects there, and very high-profile projects. So Apache is a real sort of core part of the open source movement. So let's kind of go back a little bit in time again and look at Java, because at the same time that the open source movement was kicking off, there was this programming platform, programming language that was launched by Sun Microsystems. 1995, along came Java. And that turned out to be really quite successful. Lots of people started looking at Java and saying, wow, this is really cool. We want to use Java. So they started using Java. And so that went on for a couple of years, and people used Java, and things started to develop, and more things were added to the platform, and so on. And then, in 1997, some things started changing again. And I, I put this slide up here, because I found this nice picture. On the left, you've got Scott McNeely, who was the CEO of Sun Microsystems at the time, and then you've got Steve Barmer on the right, who went on to become the CEO of Microsoft. Now, in this picture, they're smiling and laughing at each other. I don't think they were doing that in 1997, because that's when problems started to occur. And what happened was that Sun decided to sue Microsoft over their Java implementation that was used in Internet Explorer 4. Now, the reason for this was that Microsoft had licensed Java from Sun. So it was very legitimate in terms of their approach. They said, yes, we want to use Java. We shall license it from Sun. We can put it in our browser. We can use it for certain projects. But what they did, which was counter to the, the licensing agreement and what Sun objected to, was that they, they changed things. So they came along and they said, well, this is really good. You know, we've got a nice set of class libraries, but we think we should add a few class libraries here. And they also said, well, there's, there's a few class libraries we don't really like, so we'll take those ones out. Now, adding libraries is not a problem, so long as you don't do it in terms of the Java or the Java X core libraries. You can call them com.microsoft.whatever and add them, no problem at all. But adding them to the core platform, taking some of the core platform libraries away, is very significant because it breaks compatibility. And compatibility was one of the key things that Java always promoted. This write once, run anywhere approach, or write once, test everywhere approach. So Sun decided to sue Microsoft, and, and things sort of went a little bit downhill from there in terms of their relationship, which kind of led to 1998, because, again, the, the Free Software Foundation and the open source movement looked at Java and they said, wow, this is really successful. What we want to do is we want to have an open source version of Java. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an open source version of Java, because we know what the libraries are, we know what the APIs are, they're all documented. We can write the code ourselves. And they created the GNU class path project. And this is, this is, again, this is kind of an interesting one because there's a, a fundamental rule in computer science which says that you can solve any problem by adding another level of indirection. 
We do it all the time. And originally, the GNU Foundation really wanted to call it GNU Java, but they knew they weren't going to get away with that because some were going to come after them for the trademark infringement and the fact that it wasn't certified Java. So they said, right, we can't call it GNU Java, but we kind of want to have a reference to Java. So they said, well, class path. Class path is going to have something like user lib Java in it. So we'll just go one level of indirection through the class path into the name Java. So it's kind of in there, really, but not explicit, so some can't sue us. And so they started writing, basically, the core libraries and rewriting them as an open source project. And that kind of you know, took off, and people started doing some work on it. And you know, it didn't actually create a complete implementation. So then, in 1999, Sun were under pressure to standardize Java, because if you look at all the other popular languages, things like C and C++, they have standards associated with them. So you can go to ANSI, and you can get the ANSI C standard. So Sun were under pressure to do the same thing with Java. But what they wanted to do was not just hand it over to a standards organization. They didn't want to give it to ISO, they didn't want to give it to the European Computer Manufacturers Association, or any of those groups. So they said, what we need is some way of allowing other people to help define the future of Java, but without giving up total control, because we still want to have some input in terms of the direction. So they came up with the Java community process, and this is now actually 17 years old, rather than 15 years. But the idea here is that if you look at how standards are developed, you've really got two ends of the spectrum. On one side, you've got the, the complete control of one company. So one company has a product, they decide exactly what new features are going to be added, they put them into that product, they then ship it and give it to developers and say, here it is, this is what you get. And the developers just have to use what is there and hope for, that they have all the features that they want. The other end of the spectrum is the completely open standard. So the OSI, ISO, ECMA, XOpen, people like that. And that's where you can have anybody represented on the standards body. They can apply, they can get representation, and then they can add their input to how the standard is created. And the problem with that is that people can add their own ideas, and they can add exactly what they want, and they can discuss that. And I've had the, the, the dubious pleasure of sitting in some ex-open standards meetings a long time ago. And you really do find that it's like management by committee. You get a whole group of people in the room, and they've all got their own agenda, and they all want to have things their particular way. And because nobody's actually in control, it's all sort of very open, and everybody can have their own say. Getting a decision takes a long, long time. So standards, really open standards, tend to move very slowly. So some wanted something that would move faster. And the JCP is kind of in between those two. So it's the idea that we have the Java community process, we have an executive committee that has various significant companies represented on it. Some of them are um, voted on, some of them are there by default because of their involvement in Java. People like IBM, people like Oracle, obviously, are on the executive committee. And then there are expert groups associated with each JSR. And each part of Java is defined through a Java specification request. So we have Java specification requests for Java SE, there's ones for Java EE, there's even ones for Java ME. And what we have with the JCP is a golden triangle in terms of the things which make up a specification and a, a JSR. At the top of the triangle, we've got the actual specification itself. So this is the document which defines exactly what things go into a particular piece of Java. So there's a, a JSR for Java SE 8, and it defines exactly what APIs, what features have gone into Java SE 8. There's another one which will start very sh soon on Java SE 9. So that's the specification. That tells you exactly what you need to put into something in order for it to be conformant with the specification. Then you need a reference implementation. And a reference implementation is something where you take the specification and you say, right, we're going to use that specification and we're actually going to implement it and have something which shows, yep, here we are, we've got the reference that we can show against the specification. 
And then the third part of that is a thing called the TCK, or the Technology Compatibility Kit. And that's a way of testing something to ensure that it qualifies against the specification. And so the, the kind of the relationship between these is that the specification defines what needs to be in it. The reference implementation is a demonstration to show that you can actually build the specification. It's no good having a specification if you can't actually implement it. So reference implementation guarantees that the specification can be implemented. The technology compatibility kit then uses the specification. You write a bunch of tests, and that shows that the spec is unambiguous. So there's no bits where you could go, oh, OK, well, you could implement it this way, you could implement it that way, and it would meet the specification. But you know, that would not necessarily give you compatibility. So you have a, a test kit which uses the specification, and by writing enough tests, you can show that the spec is actually unambiguous. And then use the technology compatibility kit on the reference implementation to verify that it actually does conform to the specification. And clearly, you can use the TCK on other implementations to guarantee that they also meet the specification. And this, this is where things get interesting again. Because in 2005, Apache decided that they wanted to create an open source implementation of Java. So obviously, you had the GNU class path that kind of started this project. And Apache said, right, we want to, we want to start a big project in an Apache where we're going to implement Java as an open source project. And that became the Apache Harmony project. And this is where things, like I say, they, they kind of got interesting and things broke down a bit. Because in order for Apache Harmony to verify that their implementation met the specification, they needed the TCK. And so they went to Sun and they said, we would like to license, ideally for free, the TCK from you so we can verify that the Apache Harmony project matches the specification. And Sun said, no, we're not going to do that. And you might think, well, that's a bit mean of Sun. But Sun had very good reason at that time to do that because you know, I, I worked for Sun at the time, so I kind of have first-hand experience of this. At that time, 2005, the only way that Sun was actually making any money from Java was through licensing it to handset manufacturers. This is before the smartphone, so this is in the back, back in the days of Nokia, back in the days of Ericsson, Siemens, and so on. And so Java ME at that time was still something that handset manufacturers were putting on their phones and trying to get people to build applications for and develop what became the smartphone. And so Sun said, well, you know, we have in our Java this thing called the field of use restriction. So if you get Java from Sun, you can get it completely free as a download, and you can use it on your PC, you can use it on a server, we will not charge you for that. But the field of use restriction said that if you want to use Java in an embedded device, so a phone or anything that's smaller than a PC, then you had to license it. And the problem they had with Apache Harmony was that there was no field of use restriction. It's open source software. Apache didn't want to restrict people on where they could use it. They wanted to make it available anywhere they wanted. And so Sun said, well, that doesn't really kind of work with what we want to do, so we're not going to license the TCK to you. And that did become quite an issue. But at the same time, in 2006, there was a change at Sun. And Scott McNeely, who was the CEO, handed over control to Jonathan Schwartz. And Jonathan Schwartz had some, some interesting ideas about how to run a software business. He had some interesting ideas about how to change things at Sun to improve things. One of those was he decided that he was going to open source everything. He was going to open source all of the software that Sun had. And he, he basically did that. Over a couple of years, he open sourced absolutely everything. One of these big projects was OpenJDK. That's how the OpenJDK came about. And it's important to say that what happened here was that Sun open sourced its implementation of the Java development kit. It didn't open source Java, because Java is a lot more things than just the JDK. There's the specifications, there's the platform, there's the language, so on and so forth. So it open sourced the JDK. And initially, it just open sourced the compiler, Java C, and it open sourced the hotspot virtual machine. Libraries, various other bits and pieces weren't open source at that time. 
That wasn't because they didn't want to do that. It was because it actually took a lot of time to do this. And so the following year, almost all of the remaining code was open sourced. What Sun had to do was they had to go through every single piece of code that they had in Java, and they had to make sure that the copyright notices at the top were correct, they had to make sure they actually owned the copyright to them, and why I say almost all of the remaining code was open sourced was because there were things like some of the fonts, some of the color management stuff, some of the sound re reproduction things, so MP3 and, and things like that, which they didn't have the right to open source the code for. So there are a few little pieces that still shipped as binary blobs with the OpenJDK. And to address that, Red Hat stepped up and they said, right, we want to create a version of Java um, and we want that to be shippable with Linux. So it needs to conform to all of the GPL licensing, it needs to be available in all source code. All source code, source code needs to be available. So they created the ICT project. And what they did with that was to fill in the blanks, if you like. So they added the necessary fonts, they added the necessary sound, color management, and so on, as open source pieces. And that became the ICT project, so you could get an open JDK version downloadable with the distribution of Linux. And the nice thing is that they then did the logical thing, and they put back that code into the OpenJDK project so you could download it and you could have a completely open source version. So again, in 2007, things kind of changed. So this is the, the share price of Sun. And having joined Sun back in 1996, which is just to the left-hand side of the, um, the graph there, you know, I went through a very nice phase with Sun. You could see the share price going up and up and up. And we got to 2000, and obviously that was when the dot-com bubble burst. A lot of people realized that having a lot of these dot-com companies that promised to do various things on the internet weren't going to make any money. And we went from a situation where we couldn't build servers fast enough to having an awful lot of servers that we couldn't sell. Suddenly there was a, a rapid decline in our share price. But if you take the dot-com bubble out of that, you'd actually still sort of see a reasonable sort of upward trend in the share price. It, was, it wasn't so bad. But then 2007. A lot of things happened at that point. So Sun was going through this transition. It open sourced a lot of software, and that meant that it wasn't making as much money out of software as it was before, because it was trying to sell services around it, same sort of Red Hat model, rather than selling it as commercial software. And so there was a kind of rapid tail off in the share price. And you'll see there's a sort of upward tick at the end there. And there's a, a very good reason for the upward tick at the end, which was in 2009, Oracle agreed to acquire Sun. And this led to a number of decisions being made. One of the things was that because Sun had this disagreement with Apache over the TCK, it meant that all of the, the JCP work, all of the JSRs related to Java SE had come to a complete halt. Apache, being part of the JCP, weren't prepared to approve any of the JSRs without having access to the TCK. Sun weren't going to give them access to the TCK, so it all just came to a grinding halt. Now, in 2009, Sun acquired, sorry, Oracle acquired Sun, get it the right way around, yes. That would have been a very different story, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes. And a year later, again, things started to change, specifically with the OpenJDK project. So IBM, IBM was a, a big fan, big contributor to the Harmony project. And after some discussions with Oracle, after some discussions internally, they decided to move away from the Harmony project. And they would throw their weight, their engineering resources, behind OpenJDK. And that was a significant thing for them to do. So it meant that, effectively, Harmony didn't have a lot of input from engineering. Because Red Hat were already contributing to OpenJDK. IBM were contributing to it as well. The other thing was that Apple, Apple decided in 2010 to drop support for Java. This caused a bit of an uproar and people went, oh, this is really bad for Java. But then like a week later, they announced they were actually going to contribute all the Mac specific source code that they had for their version of Java to the OpenJDK project. 
That would enable Oracle to take over the builds for the Mac. They could then continue to create versions of it. People would be able to use it on their Mac as they can today. So that was a great thing. Again, nice big chunk of source code coming in, nice way of pushing the OpenJDK forward. Even people like SAP, who have a, a big interest in the JVM, joined OpenJDK and agreed to contribute code to that as well. And that led, in 2011, to the launch of Java SE 7. The reason for this was not just because Oracle had taken over Sun, but because Oracle had resolved the issues around the JCP. They came in and they decided to make some decisions. Now, these decisions didn't necessarily make everybody happy, but they made the decisions that needed to be made. And so they went to Apache and they said, understand we will never give you the TCK. So you need to accept that fact and move on. So Apache said, OK, we understand that. New custodian of Java will accept that you, you're selling us. We'll never get the TCK. We will therefore leave the JCP. We want to have nothing more to do with the JCP, which is their right. And so that's what they did. That meant that the JCP could now move forward. So JSRs could be filed. JSRs could be approved. All of that could keep moving forward. And Oracle then got the engineering teams moving again. And we got Java SE 7, five years after we had Java SE 6. And so I kind of wanted to put a slide together, which is really to show all of the things that have happened in the last sort of five years, six years, since Oracle acquired Sun. And so they, they have been very good in terms of keeping the engineering momentum moving forward. We've had Java SE 7, we've had Java SE 8, and we're in the process of going through the motions of getting Java SE 9. So there's lots of things that they've added, you know, streams, Lambda expressions, functional programming in Java that we never had before. Project Coins added a whole bunch of new features around some of the syntax. Adding a bytecode, invoke dynamic, so that you can have dynamically typed languages compiled into bytecodes and have much better performance than you would get just using the bytecodes that we had before. Fork join framework to improve the idea of multi-threaded code. Lots and lots of different things that have been added to the, the basic Java platform. So th there's been a lot of good things that Oracle have driven forward with Java. So let, let's go back and have another look at OpenJDK in terms of how well that's performed as an open source project. Because yes, it's been open, you know, JDK has been open sourced. There are some big companies contributing to it, but what else is, is sort of happening in the OpenJDK space? Well, one of the interesting ones there is this company you may have heard of called Twitter. Now, in 2014, Twitter made a decision because prior to that, when they first started writing Twitter, it was all written in Ruby. And they discovered that Ruby was a nice language to write code in and do sort of quick prototyping and building sort of small applications. But once you want to start scaling up to the scale that Twitter does, it just doesn't work. So they needed a different platform to run their application on. And they looked around and they said, yes, we will use the JVM. JVM is a nice mature technology. It's been around at, at that time for nearly 20 years. There's a lot of work gone on the JVM. And so they decided they'd use the JVM. They decided that they'd write their code mostly in Scala, but with a lot of Java as well. So it's compiled into bytecodes, runs on JVM. Great. So they're just another user of Java. But they also decided at that time that they would go out and they would hire engineers not to work on their application code, but to work on the JVM. So they decided to use OpenJDK as their source code base, build their own JVM, have their engineers tune it, tweak it, modify it, to make it perform in the way they needed to, specifically for Twitter. And so in the end, they actually end, ended up hiring a, a bunch of engineers who actually used to work for Sun, funnily enough. But the important point here is that they took that, they built their own JVM, they didn't need to run the TCK on it because they weren't making it publicly available to other people. So compatibility wasn't an issue for them. But the work they did internally, they also started feeding that back into the OpenJDK project. So it wasn't just a one-way street of them taking the code and using it. It was also putting stuff back and, and being a good open source citizen as well. Now, if we look at activity, there's a, 
openhub.net is, is a good website to get statistics about open source projects. And this is the, the number of contributors that you've got in terms of OpenJDK. And if you go back to the sort of beginning of OpenJDK, you'll see a nice upward trend. Yeah, there's a bit of variation there, but there's a nice upward trend in terms of the number of people who are committing to the OpenJDK. And we're up at uh, a bit, probably about 115, 120 at the moment. And you can also, I'm sure you probably can't read this at the back, you may not even be able to read it at the front. Um, but this is a sort of summary of statistics. Now, I won't bore you with all of it, but it's interesting that if this was from um, last month. There were nearly 8,000 commits last month, which is up 2,305 on last year, on the previous year, which is 40% up. So you can see that there's a significant uptick in terms of activity, in terms of people actually you know, doing work on the project. And again, to sort of put this into to context, if you look at the, the OpenJDK as a project and you go back and you say, right, over the lifetime of the project, there have been about nearly 36,000 commits to the project. There's 407 contributors who've actually contributed to that. And that accounts for a whopping nearly 7 million lines of code. So you probably can see, well, okay, well, IBM probably put a big amount of code in, Apple put a big amount of code in. But, you know, it's, it's a good-sized project. And again, to sort of put that in context, if you compare it to Android, so Android's another open source project, uses something like Java. Um, and so that's got way more commits. So it's, it's like order of magnitude bigger in terms of commits. So 533,000 commits, order of magnitude bigger in terms of the number of people committed. But in terms of lines of code, it's only about twice as many. So you can see that the, the OpenJDK project is quite significant in terms of the amount of code that's actually being committed by a relatively small number of people. So if you want to do work on the OpenJDK, there's a nice book that's been published, the OpenJDK Cookbook. And what that does is it takes you through the process of downloading the source code, creating a build environment, building your own JDK. And then it also takes you some examples of how to modify things and how to actually make changes and, and experiment with those sorts of things. And this is actually something that's, that's taken a long time to kind of settle down, if you like. Because when the OpenJDK project was first released, all the source code was there, but it was almost impossible to build it. And I say that simply because there were so many sort of like particular things that you needed. You needed certain versions of a compiler, you needed this version of that, and all sorts of different things. It was very, very complicated to actually build it. With the work that's gone on on the OpenJDK project, it's now much, much simpler. You basically, you know, dot configure, make, boom, off it goes. So you've got a, a book which tells you a lot more about how to do that. The other thing that's built up around that is the Adopt OpenJDK project. And this is one that was started by Java user groups. So anybody here involved in Adopt OpenJDK? Oh, one person. Okay. So it was, it was led by Java user groups who said, we want to help people get involved in OpenJDK. We want to help develop Java. And so there's lots of different things on the website. Um, I've put a bunch of, well, there's a link down the bottom there, there's a couple of places you can go, where you can see what's going on, and you can get involved. But clearly, the idea of this is to, to understand how to work on the source code. It's, it's not quite the case of anybody can contribute source code to the OpenJDK. You need to go through a fairly rigorous process of proving that you are you know, suitable to make changes to JDK, because you don't really want people just going, oh, I'm going to change this bit here. I'm going to change um, inheritance. So it'll be multiple inheritance. So that, that'll be a good idea. I'll do that. And, and then that'll work for everybody. Things like that you don't want just being put in without any kind of control. So this is a way of getting involved from a simple starting point. And the kind of things that they do is they, they take you from the ability to make changes, which might be correcting spelling mistakes in comments, all the way through to if you want to rewrite the garbage collector. Well, okay, maybe not rewrite the garbage collector, but you, know, you can do some fairly big things. Which sort of leads me to this thing, JEP285. Now, I want to talk about this just for a couple of minutes, because this is, this is one of the JDK enhancement proposals. And you can see that we're up to, well, over 285 now. So there's, there's quite a lot of these things. And this is 
sort of complementary to the JCP. The JCP defines the specification for Java. So you have Java SE is a JSR. But that only covers the language syntax. It only covers the libraries, so the APIs. It doesn't cover how things are implemented. It also doesn't cover tools and things that fit around that in terms of the JDK, so the compiler and, and other tools like that. So to allow people to contribute ideas around that from outside of Oracle, there are these things called JEPs, JDK Enhancement Proposals, which are designed to be reasonably small amounts of work, not huge projects, but not a couple of line changes, so that people can add their own ideas. And the, the reason I'm pointing out JEP 285 is because this is significant because it is a small change to Java. In fact, it's only adding one method to the thread class. So there's a new method going to be in JDK 9, which is on spin weight. And you think to yourself, well, okay, that's very exciting. Why is that so significant? Well, the, the significance is it is the first JEP that's actually been accepted from outside of Oracle. And I'm happy to report that it was Azul Systems, who I work for, who actually managed to get this in as a JEP. And um, this is significant because it shows that the process works. It shows that it is open, other people can contribute ideas, and they can get them into the JDK. So we're actually planning on, on submitting some more JEPs with some more kind of significant pieces of work as well. Which sort of leads me to Zulu.org and what we at Azul are doing in terms of the Open JDK, Because Azul is a company that has really only two products. Both of them are JVMs. We have Zing, which is our commercial product, targeted at low latency, targeted at people who have a garbage collector, could be an issue. So we've replaced the garbage collector from Hotspot. We have one which doesn't have long pauses, doesn't fall back to a full compacting garbage collector as the way that everything else does. But the other thing we have is a build of the OpenJDK. So we take the OpenJDK source, we build it, and we then create a distribution, a binary distribution of that, which we call Zulu. Why is that significant? Well, firstly, we have a license for the TCK. So we can run the TCK on our OpenJDK build, and we can verify that it conforms with the specification. So we can call it Java. It is a true open source version of Java. JDK. Um, the other thing about that that's really nice is that OpenJDK doesn't have a field of use restriction. So we can actually provide that for embedded applications without having to have a license fee. Now, we obviously want to do it commercially, but we will uh, discuss licensing terms in terms of whether you just have one-off payment, whether you pay per device, per core, whatever. We're not restricted in terms of the way that Oracle license things, where they do it as a licensing fee, we can negotiate with our customers in terms of the best thing for them and us. So this is an interesting thing in terms of OpenJDK. Which leads me to the, the kind of last part of my presentation, which is where's next? So we looked a long retrospective of open source and OpenJDK and where we got to, and all the great things that Oracle have done. Where are we going from here? Because <laughs> it's funny, because you keep hearing these, these things where people say, oh, Java is dying. Java is on the way out. And there, there's kind of like a, a joke about, you know, the, the thing that, that you always hear is Java is dying. So it must be dying. It's self-fulfilling prophecy. But I don't agree. I don't think Java is dying. Java SE9. So this is a fairly easy one. I mean, I'm not really looking into a crystal ball here because you can actually look at the specifications and you can look at what's in the project at the moment. So there's some interesting things there. Big one is obviously Project Jigsaw. Modularity in Java and breaking up the, the core libraries into modules, encapsulating some things so that uh, things like Sun, Misc, Unsafe are not going to be quite as readily available as they were before. But there's also other things that are going into there. So there's, there's things like private methods in interfaces. And you go, hang on, why would you want a private method in an interface? Aha, but there is logic to the, there is method in the madness, which is that because we now have from JDK 8 the idea of um, multiple inheritance of behavior, so you can actually put implementation through a default method or a static method in an interface. By adding private methods in an interface, you can actually have code which is encapsulated within that interface and can only be used or shared between other publicly available parts of the interface. 
Um, other things is compact strings which are going in, variable handles, uh, some other stuff that's kind of being added there. So let's look at Java SE 10. Slightly smaller set of things here because we're getting a little bit harder in terms of predicting the future. Now, value types is something that has been talked about for JDK 10. Um, Brian Gertz, who's the, the chief architect for the Java language, has done a number of presentations on this, and that's kind of connected as well to generics over primitive types. So the idea of you could have a collection of ints rather than a collection of integer objects. So these are things which are quite core and, and quite interesting in terms of Java C10. Um, we're probably looking at more support for non-Java languages, so better things in terms of um, the, the bytecodes that we use, better things in terms of NASHORN for JavaScript execution and so on. Um, executing code on the GPU rather than just the CPU. This is a big thing that's it's been around for a while in terms of a project, and we may see some of this actually coming through in JDK 10. Probably going to see some more stream enhancements. They'll come up with some nice new ideas for things in there as well. And then looking way, way into the future, what's Java SE 20 going to look like? Now, I have no idea. You know, I'm really just like throwing out ideas here because um, you know, even when I was at Oracle, we only ever talked about up to Java SE 12. So Java SE 20, you know, what could we do? Operator overloading. OK, who would like to see operator overloading in Java? Stop bad, no. <laughs> operator overloading, we don't want that, no. Um, could we get reified generics in Java in, a, in that sort of time scale? Maybe. What about properties, first class properties? That's something that people keep asking for. Maybe we can get that in there. Um, maybe we'll even change arrays so that we can use a long indices rather than a, an int. Who knows? And maybe we'll get a standard JSON parser. You can hope, can't you? I mean, you really can. Um, probably not going to see Java used on the browser anymore. What about unsigned values? Could, could that be something that could get added? Um, multiple inheritance of state. Now, we already have multiple inheritance of types. We have multiple inheritance of behavior from JDK 8. What about if we added multiple inheritance of state and then we suddenly become like C++? Again, no, don't want that. Um, so that, that really is all I have in the, this presentation. I, I think that the future is bright. I think that the future is Java. I, I think Java has a lot of life left in it. I think the fact that Oracle and other companies are putting so much effort into this and actually thinking very carefully about what changes to make to the language. You know, JDK is a great example. Adding this functional style of programming is a real sort of refreshing thing in terms of the language. Now, Come to my presentation later on this afternoon. We'll, we'll talk about some of the lessons I learned in using um, functional programming, which is, is quite interesting. Um, don't think that because you've got a hammer that everything is a nail. But the idea of putting these things into Java, I think we'll continue to see these nice ideas, these interesting ideas add in. The language will stay fresh, and it will stay relevant to the things that we're doing as we go forward. So I guess. With that, I've got time. I mean, if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Yeah, I would like to ask about the, the beginning of open uh, Java. Could you tell me what was the reason for the first time that was available? Right, so, so the question is why? Why did Apache Harmony decide to create an open source version of Java when you could get it, it was freely available, you could, it could put it on a PC, you could put it on a, a server without any cost. Why would you create an open source version? Well, I suppose that not being an Apache person, it's a little difficult to answer this, but I think that the motivation was primarily to get around the field of use restriction. They wanted to be able to use Java anywhere, and that meant on embedded devices, it meant on mobile devices. That's what they were really after. And that was the, the key point that really kind of Sun and Apache kind of bumped heads on was the fact that they didn't, Sun didn't want them to avoid the, the field of use restriction. The kind of interesting thing that counterpoint to that is that literally, you know, I said that uh, Apache started in what was it, 2005, 2006, I think it was. Um, a year later was when Sun open sourced the JDK. That doesn't have the field of use restriction. So it's funny that, you know, only a year later, Sun open sourced JDK without the field of use restriction. 
But the problem was it was so difficult to build, and there was bits missing initially, so it was a lot of work. But nobody looked at it and went, oh, yes, we'll just take that, and we can put it on a mobile phone or put it in an embedded device and make it uh, an alternative to the, the Sun version. So that, that was the real answer, was to avoid the field of use restriction. Any other questions? Okay, well, in that case, thank you very much.